Boa tarde. Vamos nos... Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let's take our seats. Good afternoon again. I'm going to ask a question because I, it's a shame, but I couldn't uh, follow up. Uh, how was the morning uh, session? Was it interesting, fun? I had uh, several feedback messages saying that it was really great. Some people requesting for the code. There's some kind of uh, exchanges uh, happening. It's important, this is important to see alternative solutions of the colleagues and then we can ask them to forcefully or not collaborate with us. So we're going to start the panel of the the afternoon of the second day of, of the event with the profession of the Brazilian Electricity Regulatory Agency talking about the risk assessment modeling dams with association of multi-criteria decision analysis and theory of fuzzy uh, sets. So please, Sajulati, the floor is yours. Aren't you applauding the, the the speakers? Please, people, let's give him a round of applauses. Sergio, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The objective of this study is to present one of the actions that are being carried out in the National Agency of Electricity in this topic of the, the dam safety uh, risk analysis. This work came from a demand of the agency to improve the control in this aspect of safety and it was developed in the scope of the master's degree program, master's degree of uh, applied com computing in the, in the University of Brasilia, in a partnership with the technicians of the regulatory agency. First of all, like before going to the topic, I would like to uh, introduce my agency. So this is our mission to uh, provide uh, favorable conditions for the development of the market of uh, electricity f so that it can be done uh, in a balanced way with the agents and, and the benefits to the society. So it goes, it encompasses different processes that uh, goes through regulation, mediation, uh, monitoring, and also the grant and authorization of uh, construction works. So the goal is to offer a more fair uh, fee for electricity incentive sustainability and conciliate interests. To do so, the agency is organized in a very horizontalized structure. The superintendences have a relatively big autonomy. This project was developed in the uh, spectrum of SCG and it's highlighted, SFG is highlighted in red. We are going through a process of enhancing our monitoring and inspection processes and the structuring of our databases and working strongly with risk assessment. So that's why I bring this slide based on the framework of Gartner, in which, uh, in terms of risk management through an evaluation that they promoted, we fit in that condition of uh, guide, guiding agency that uh, manages the risks that other people might uh, take. So in the use of information, in the view of our superintendents, it is an engine for opportunities and risks to favor the development of the market and assure the provision of good services. Well, what happens in the case of the dams? Uh, recently, we have seen a change in the structure of this sector uh, on the market in general. The, uh, the arising of a great number of dams of different sizes and types, you, you have um, undertakings with different ages, uh, new ones and very old ones with almost 100 years old. The, 
entering of little professional investors with little knowledge of the rules of the business and, and rules of safety, some uh, cases of negligence in terms of good practices, uh, and taking into account the risks that are imposed to society. This had been observed by the agency, and it culminated with the creation of the uh, DEM safety law, uh, the law 12334. Currently, we work with over 5,000 uh, facilities, uh, power plants with different uh, dam structures of, of different sizes, and the total of dams is uh, of approximately 900. So we want to restrict this universe working with 50 uh, dams, and there was a distinction in terms of technology. To adequately represent the sector, we work with 34 uh, land or earth uh, dams and 16 concrete uh, dams. To do this monitoring and inspection activity, the superintendents uh, developed a, a, a supervising uh, model or inspection model, uh, which is divided in three levels. The first level is the monitoring, where we aim to carry out a census of the sector, identifying the situation of the companies. From this, you have a selection criteria, and you extract some dams, and you start uh, remote actions. And if there is any other question regarding the safety uh, matters, we, we go to the uh, actions in person. It is a model that is uh, replicated in other activities. And then one uh, issue came up. We can improve this. And within the discussions, we realized that the starting point would be the monitoring process. How can we improve this monitoring? as to improve the safety of dam structures. Then we went to research. To reach the, uh, this uh, response, this answer, we, we outlined the main objective and also some, object, some specific objects objects which I will highlight in this presentation. The first uh, specific object is to identify the risk factors associated to the safety standards that are recognized in the regulations. The second specific objective is to characterize the, the dams regarding risk. And none of this would be uh, feasible in our perception if we didn't ask these questions to the electricity sector or the dam sector. There's no need to identify the factors, to work with what is described in law, but if at some point there is a perception of the market that we cannot capture, then we need this third specific object. The research was quite broad, uh, just the third the third objective was to validate the risk factors associated to, to the to the uh, dams through interviews. Here we we worked we checked the dam structures from 1970s until the year 2000 because with the computational advancement these techniques were became stronger and then we could build our model. Basically, it follows two lines, as it was explained in the, in the presentations in the morning, we reached the consensus that not only one specific technique will bring the solution, but a set of approaches and methods, methodologies. The law works basically with the punctuation uh, system, with the ranking of concepts. So the best way to translate these concepts that were described in the law was the theory of fuzzy uh, sets. Regarding the comp competitional competences, we identified the most adequate for the way the law is structured, the approach with triangular numbers. 
the other side was, well, I can translate what the entrepreneur is saying based on what is questioned in terms of law. How can I work on this classification and this ordinary? The law deals with several topics. The multi criteria evaluation seemed to be more adequate to us. And then another, a second uh, doubt came. Which approach would we use? The American school, they work in the logic of compensation, or the European uh, school, more specifically the French school that works with relations of indifference and prefer preference. In our case, given the compensatory nature of the American school and the fact that you're working with risks, this compensation could mask uh, a certain uh, bad performance in a certain factor. So we chose the French uh, school. In the family of existing methods, we selected ELECT-3. This is a little description of the model. I think it's OK for everyone to see it. But the idea is basically this. In the top level, we our first idea was to identify the most common anomalies according to the, to the specific object one of the work. For each for each anomaly identified, we added some risk factors, and it is all worked in the fuzzy environment. So we, we collected the dams that were evalu evaluated by the agents. They received the survey. All of this is fuzzified, so you have the results. And after the, the, this fuzzification, you have the risk index related to each of the identified anomalies. Based on the, these indices, if we wanted, we could we could develop by specific topics the uh, specific uh, inspection activities regarding their specifications, and we organized th these results in a general classification. So we have a global risk index. That is a little bit far from the legislation, but it is more well adjusted to our needs. So now going to the end of my presentation, the objectives, they generated three results, three specific results. And so as we saw in the previous slide, we identified five events and these events are connected to 12 risk factors and they are connected to the, the, the legislation regarding dam safety and security. Uh, result two uh, generated the categorization of these dams. And in result number three, among 135, no, among 155 entrepreneurs and in charge uh, for the construction of the security and safety of these dams, we were able to receive the responses from 57 expert engineers. It seems to be a low number, but in terms of representativeness uh, when it comes to engineering, 57 engineering uh, engineers responding is not, uh, to, is not neglig negligible. And so regarding this uh, objective three, it's about 78%. So these are these are two examples, the two main factors that we we determined in the literature, in the international reading. Uh, we have percolation, and it's an over. Uh, uh, it's like an infiltration that is going to start corroding. It's li just like a, 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 a cancer. And so in goal number two, I only have this view, the, the, uh, the result of one of these indexes that has to do with the overflowing, overtopping. And so this is based on construction techniques and then the risk factors allowed us to identify 
via a, a signal the, the hydroelectrical power plants that would uh, show this kind of anomaly and even depending on the the phenomenon that we're going to understand regarding the geographic uh, situation and location and uh, when it comes to overtopping the overtopping the land dams that are located in the north of the country and they are subject to uh, very intense hydrological regimes and so they are more susceptible to this kind of problem, this kind of anomaly, the overtopping or overflowing. And just as a stratification uh, for my result number three, I have the interviews and the contribution of each one of the agents. So basically, the highest number of respondents were in the south and in the southeast regions. And because of the, the history of those regions, and that's where the big dams started being constructed, and some interesting results were found, and now they are being added to the second phase of our project. We are readjusting the indexes based on some of the perceptions that were extracted. And the main idea is for this survey to generate a scientific article, a new study that is going to be published. So the study also helped us to identify that there is a distortion, distortion of what the agents consider to be something relevant to classify the risks. And so maybe the assessment is not adequate of our dams. But the most important criteria are the ones that are easiest to measure. But the literature says that not necessarily this is going to be the best factor. So they consider the height of a dam, it is more relevant than what is in the foundation because the height I can see and I can measure, but the foundation is hidden from my eyes and I cannot measure this. And we have to go deeper into this. Some other important things, which were the flow, the project flow, they were underestimated, concerns with the locks, the reliability of the the overflow structures 20% of the respondents identified the the occurrence of uh, waste waste And so 40% of the respondents identified the, the occurrence of uh, risky factors and that required the review or an amendment of the regulation And so they want to assess the technical competence of the people in charge and also the quality of the instruments, like sensors, and that we add uh, on the dam to keep up with everything. So they are retrofitting our project. All of these items are retrofitting our project. And the version 2.0 that is going to be created soon we're going to have a more reliable uh, idea of what truly happens with our locks and dams. So this was an overview. The research was very, very long, and it would be very ambitious of my part to try to share everything and all the details with the work with you, of the work with you within 20 minutes. And so I'm available to any questions or doubts you may have. So now I'm going to invite our next guest. He's going to talk about. So he's going to talk about model of recommendation for financial agents in the uh, Brazilian Development Bank for micro, small, and medium enterprises and their relationship channels. Mr. Fernando Pinhatti. 
Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Fernando Pinhati. I coordinate one uh, of the data science teams at the National Development Bank. It's a recent team, but we have some interesting projects. We have had some interesting results, and I wanted to show one of these results with you, okay? And so it's about this uh, recommendation model that we created that was meant to work with our website with uh, SMEs, and it's called MPME. But what is the MPME channel? Basically, it's a website, and so you can surf on our website, and then you open this tab, and the small and medium uh, entrepreneur or business person, they can surf here trying to get funding from the BNDS, which is the, the Brazilian Development Bank. So why do you need this funding? Why do you need this credit? What are you going to do with it? And then the person can describe this. Oh, I want to purchase a new fleet of trucks so that I can renew my trucks. What is the estimated amount of the funding? And then he's going to fill in uh, the form, where are you going to invest this? Where are you going to purchase the material? And the main objective is that this channel is going to try, among all of the types of credits we have in the development bank, we're going to try to translate this into one of the funding options that we have. Um, making the choice easier, making the funding choice easier to try to meet the demands that this investor has or this entrepreneur. So as you can see on the slide, and so uh, he chose Finami, the one to buy trucks, and the average uh, interest rate is 0 0.99 a month, and uh, the BNDS can finance up to 80% of the and so he's going to try to understand how this funding works, what are the conditions, and then he's going to say, oh, okay, this is what I want, and so this is what I'm going to do. And this is done in a very logical way, and we don't need a recommendation model. And now, maybe we have a certain issue here. The BNDS does not have bank branches. We work jointly with the financial agents that are the commercial banks and the banks here in Brazil. And so this funding to the micro business person is going to depend on a certain bank accepting that proposal. And then for the funding proposal of the entrepreneur, we show them all the banks that can uh, give him that credit in that region. So. The person can choose. He can choose more than one bank, by the way. And for each bank that he chooses, there is a summary of the request with all of the details of the proposal. It's going to be sent to the banks, and the bank is going to analyze. Ah, cool. I like this. I want to sign this contract with this uh, business person, or no, no. No, it's not very similar to what we do in this region. This is not uh, according to what we do. The price is too high. The value is too high. And so maybe they can adjust. And then we have a, a big question. How can we help business people to choose the to choose the financial agent or the bank that would have the highest potential to sign this financing contract with that person. So this is the objective that we're trying to achieve. So we're trying to achieve a be the best conversion rate, conversion rate. And this is also good for web portals. And so and so I, in my case, we want to, to sign the contract. This is our main goal. And we have many approaches. For instance, if the proposal was badly written or, the, or we find some kind of deficiency of the information, maybe I could recommend something else, the review of something, review the proposal, 
in something that the agent is going to accept easy, easily. And one of the approaches that we can use is, for example, a system of recommendations. So a system of recommendations. What is a system of recommendations? So this cartoon is explaining it in a more educational way. Those who buy bananas also buy milk, carrots, uh, bread, and the other can, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's honey. And so bringing to our reality or to our sector, we can identify proposals that had a certain profile and that were accepted by a certain financial agent. If this uh, proposal, this uh, profile of proposal enters again, we can recommend such and such a uh, financial agent. What kind of data do I have to analyze this? Data of the client himself or herself. He's going to fill in the wizard. And then the size of the company, the revenue, the sector that he works, the CNAE that he works with, data of the proposal itself, the, the value he wants to finance, the purpose of the funding, etc. And also the financing history of the financial agent, because many, many transactions have already been done. So we don't start from scratch. And the recommendation system that we have, we already have history of the, fi uh, the fundings that have already happened. And we're going to use this to try to identify similar profiles that were uh, identified. And so we have all of this. We input this into the recommendation system, and we wait for a match. Oh, it's a match. So one of the approaches that we use that can y be used to do the, the recommendation system is clustering. Clustering is going to try to cluster similar proposals is going to try to identify them by isolating these clusters. So a certain kind of proposal, maybe the clustering algorithm is going to be identified, and maybe Caixa Econômica Federal or Itaú likes this kind of proposal. They like to meet these demands. And so Cicred, Scania, and so on and so forth. And I can identify for other uh, financial agents. I can also use the decision tree. The decision tree is a more logical way. You go from uh, the top down, and then what are the proposals? What are the history of the financing or funding that have already been approved? And then I start creating a logical tree. And so I have, for example, a set of cars. And these cars are based on axes. And then I go to the cargo. What kind of cargo? Or what is the weight? Five tons, five tons. Maybe I can have uh, vehicles for passengers. Maybe I can have uh, vehicles for cargo. And if I go to the trees, to the leaves of the trees, maybe I'm overfitting my population. So in general, to use the decision tree here, we do some pruning of the tree to in a certain level so that we can have a pertinence probability uh, for that certain cluster. Not all the parameters are going to be explored. And then there is a per percent uh, percentage of uh, pertinence. It's like a, a pertinence score. And so regarding the proposals, the funding proposals, maybe they are related to some financial agents, some banks that uh, usually work with these proposals. And so we created three models. We created um, two models based on this cluster model. The first model used the history of the funding of the financial agents, so it was more absolute the number of financial agents that signed that kind of contract or proposal. The second model uses the same approach, but is trying to do a little bit more of relative uh, conclusions, come to relative conclusions. So the agents that uh, more signed the proposals regarding the type of each one. So they, they have the same 
the same uh, approach, but the strategy is completely different. In model three, three we have the decision tree. Model three was a decision tree, and it was trying to analyze the types of proposals, if they were similar, what was the conversion rate, so I am on a team, and the other team is in the business department, and my team is more in the IT department. And so we operationalize these models using a free and open source software, and you can call them in R, and you have the Quest protocol. This made our life much, much, lives much easier because we have Java, and it was very nice to use it. And then we could create the models. And so how did we verify this? And we started producing this. The idea was to have a, a test, test, A, B, test. And the A, B test, nothing more, nothing less, is our recommendation, what are we going to do, what we have decided. In part, the uh, population is going to access this new function. And the other part is going to continue accessing our website in the traditional way. It's going to be our control group. It's an experiment. It's a trial. And then we're going to compare the metrics, OK? regarding the control group and the non-control group. Since we have three models, we put the three models into production plus the control group. We routed it with the CPU with 25% of uh, delivery to the models, so plus 25% of the control group, then we have 100% uh, of the population. Now, what metrics did we uh, evaluate? First one was a support met metrics to know how much this functionality was received, its clip-through rate. I showed a recommendation here, and I asked myself, is this client understanding this recommendation? Do they agree with it, or are they just ignoring it, and this recommendation? So this is one of the metrics that we're going to work on. The other metric, which is the the objective, remember the question asked that was to improve this matching of the financial agent and the component, which is the conver conversion. The conversion could be started what a financial agent we chose. And of course, we have a new functionality in the website. We want to test the influence of this recommendation in the conversion. So we measured the proposal, the proposals that had the recommendations accepted, and we could get the conversion rate. Here now, look at the results. We have this part, which is the click through rate. Basically, we have models one, two, and three here. Number two is down there in the bottom. I'm sorry I didn't put the, the axis, but it is, it is a, a chart re regarding the number of, the total number of recommendations uh, over the accepted recommendations. Model two is a cluster. One and two are clusters, and three, the one in the top, is the uh, decision tree model. The two cluster models, they seem to have to be more successful among the SMS, um, among the small and medium enterprise uh, owners. And they will collect the information generated by the models. We, there are several reasons for this, and we have to go deep in this analysis to understand this behavior. But all models have a good performance to, uh, in relation to the eff effectiveness of the recommendation. The, re the effectiveness is being measured by the acceptance of the user. There is another uh, uh, effectiveness, which is the effectiveness of the finance, financial agent. When I recommend a proposal and it is accepted, the financial agent receives 
a more qualified client. I have seen in the history, in his history, that he normally works with this type of client. Of course, there are many nuances in, in this environment, but when the algorithm is right, I detect a behavior pattern of that uh, financial agent. And if the client falls into that, that pattern, that person is a, is a potential lead. When I qualify this lead a little better to the financial agent, and when it is when there is an agreement, they uh, you improve the conversion rate. This chart is showing the conversion itself. This is a probability chart. Models one and two are are down in the bottom, and the three is up. So we see that the cluster algorithms have lower results in comparison uh, regarding conversion in comparison to the decision tree algorithm, which had a very good result in terms of conversion. We had this graph uh, regarding the conversion rate uh, measured in the model. So the big, one, the biggest one is the green one, which is it is it is the control group. It's bigger in 10 percent. And here you see it's bigger in 20% compared to the control. Model 3 shows the probability of having 94% of the times better in 20% at least compared to the control. So it is a very interesting result for us. And here we're going to have 94% of the times better than the control. Uh, the cluster, which is a, an absolute re uh, reference model, uh, see, has not doesn't have a very good result. It is even some, sometimes the, the the dummy or the control was uh, better than it, so it was not really recommended. It was not a good strategy of recommendation. In model two, which was the relative frequency. It was in the middle of the way. It has a slight inclination to be better than the dummy. That's why we chose model 3. And we used it for the production. So, well, what do we have for the conclusion of this project? On, this, on the bridge between the entrepreneur and the financial agent that will provide the the money of this the loan for the entrepreneur, we can have an increase of up to 20% of this matching, this conversion for this small project. We, we make these clients happy, these entrepreneurs happy because they start believing that it is possible to do 20% more and to obtain the loan from the Brazilian uh, Development Bank. So many times they are beginners in, in their businesses and it's important to have this type of incentive for them. And also uh, the financial agent is happy because they are receiving proposals that have a better pot potential of conversion in their vision as well. So the leads are better qualified. Okay. And with all this, the society as a whole wins, because if I'm converting 20% more, which represents about 40 million reais uh, paid uh, in a year, I have all this money for the development of the, that region where this company is um, present, generating more um, businesses, developing more uh, employment and development. It will contribute for the development of the region of, of that uh, uh, company and to the Brazil, which is one of the goals of, of the Brazilian Development Bank. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fernando. You were not, em you didn't, didn't feel jealous because they have a team of data science. Uh, oh, I wonder. We, uh, the Brazilian development development has money, so yeah, that's why they have so many employees. Now we're going to find out 
what will be has to the DM. It's a good practice for the documentation of data mining in the textual classification project. I'm going to call somebody you have seen before, Marcos Varela. I'm, I'm going to turn on my chronometer. Thank you. Good afternoon. Now I'm going to present to you. Uh, in the morning, you saw the, classifi the classifier, which was the beginning of the good practices that I'm going to present to you now as a set of good practices. It is a way to define a methodology, so I will call it methodology to make it simple. So if CADOP is making a difference for the Federal Court of Accounts and the public agencies who interact with this TC system, this methodology that I made for myself, for you as well, you who work in, in the data analysis uh, area, or if you intend to work in this, and also for our institutions, and I hope, I really hope, it's going to make a difference. You have, a, you can see a link of the digital library of TCU for the video of my uh, the presentation of this work and the PowerPoint uh, file. Well, the data is changing, and the ability to change with it makes a difference to the innovation. Contextualizing it, that, uh, data mining is a sub area of data analysis. Data analysis, uh, in turn, is the data science applied in practice. So, the data mining is a process of exploring uh, data, finding standards to create knowledge. Many things that I'm going to say here uh, expresses my feeling, as I told you in the morning. I came to this area one year ago in my specialization uh, training course for data analysis for control. For me and for many people here, data mining and machine learning is a scary island with many volcanoes, but it's not really that. There are methodologies. CRISP DM is a methodology. In fact, however, these methodologies, as you can see, have many interactions. They have repetitive cycles, and these tasks happen uh, simultaneously. So, in practice, there are many possibilities. The several techniques that can be used, they have hyperparameters, and one hyperparameter can be a real number. And then you have infinite possibilities for one parameter. So in practice, the methodology, the, the projects do not follow a structured uh, way. And there is a lack in the management of data, mining, uh, data management uh, projects in the literature. The process also depends on the team, the abilities of people. Yes, it is a complex process, and this is really important. These projects, these data mining projects, they don't leave ropes. In my room, there are f I have four colleagues who works who work with in this area, but in practice, we don't know what one is doing, or what another one is doing, but we, under, we see the, 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 the outcomes, but how the person got to that uh, result. We don't, we, don't, we don't have, we're like climbers without a rope. So people go up the mountains alone, they deliver the product, but they don't leave a rope for you. They, we don't know how the, the process was, was carried out. And to keep this knowledge, it is, for the organization, it is a, a priceless property and or asset. It cannot be uh, enclosed to the to the to the persons to the to the minds of the of the 
the professionals, the employees. And people get retired and they take the, the knowledge with them. So, and this knowledge is, is priceless. And the point is, how can we register this? And this is what my work is going to show you. Now I'm going to go through quickly to the motivation, something that I personally went through, and I ex hope that you all, you all went through this same thing. So any any uh, similarity is just a coincidence. So it is a hypothetical uh, example. You you are in a forest and you want to find a, a rock, a stone that ha that adjusts to the data. So you go, you start your mission. The path is challenging. It seems to be untranspassable with scary pathways. And as you go on, new techniques come and you, f you feel you're lost. The fears, they, w they are weight on your back. But the pathways are uh, beaten. You, you mark those pathways so to make sure you've been there and many of them become promising and hope overcomes despair and fear some routes require new skills and others cannot be uh, walked on but yes we find the models that we need we r register them we measure and adjust the models with the data that are tested we have all the numbers and metrics. We learn our, look at this uh, neural network. We learn about the path that we are, we are going to and about the models. For example, a good practice in a hypothetical way is to, to wash the, the, the stone before doing the measurings. Sometimes using the, the correct tool is a way for the solution. Yes, there are traps in this path in the forest, but there is a limit for falling in these traps because thank goodness we learn. And well, we uh, you know, boogeyman is something from the childhood. We overcome our, our fears and we do our best. Yes, we have a pathway where we, where we went through. We have the map we found a perfect model which is like a precious stone we also have the documentation of this stone we have the accuracy the f1 the precision everything but just to reflect on it in new missions in new projects what what is this document of the product worth where is the where are the notes taken in, during the pathways and experiences and, and the learning that you that you acquired, where is the where is the trace of the process? Okay, now I'm going to present to you the proposal, which was my um, the thesis that I defended in my in the in the end of my specialization course. Well, we need to good practice for the documentation of the, the path that we walked on. And the documentation is of the process, not the product, which is normally our traditional focus. It is exactly what this author says. It's, it is what is behind the artifacts, the values, the experiences, the reasons, the talks. And it, it encompasses three activities. It corresponds to the analogies of the forest, indication of the pathway, that we call actions here, the definition of action, the synthesis of learning, and training records, which are the concepts concepts that are rec recorded in the proposal. These concepts they have a virtual uh, virtuous cycle among them, because a, a definition of action contextualizes some experiences, which promote learning and influence new actions and you, you are in this loop. And regarding this information, there are several uh, data that can be stored. In the definition of action, the pathway of the project, the arrows that, that you have, 
at first it's not the record of the details but the information regarding the definition for example I'm going to have to bring a, a hypothetical example of definition of uh, real estate prices just to use it as an example an example of action is on October 10th I recorded this action we need to experience as characteristics of the real estate in the model the number of floors and the number of bathrooms so I need to register that to to take a note of this as time passes this can happen unfortunately we may execute re re repeated actions if we don't have this control the training courses which is the second documented concept it is the experimentation itself the application of the mathematical algorithm or algorithms to the data so that we can extract the the, the patterns this gentleman is the creator of the Python library and he comments this uh, virtual cycle that I mentioned. I'm going to read the last sentence. The more interactions uh, in this repetitive cycle you can execute, more refined and powerful your ideas will become, and as a consequence, your models as well. Here is an example of a training. There is a certain date. It says here that uh, it, ma it mentions the variables that I used to find the price, the algorithms, the goal that I reached, the separation of, of testing data and of course the re registration could be in a spreadsheet it's good to have this code it's indispensable that this activity is automatic uh, connected to your platform and lastly the learning which are all the, the teachings and learnings that we acquire in, in our practice and so they treat sometimes knowledge and experience as the same thing. So the description of an event in a project is a very important experience item. And here we have examples. So in this hypothetical case, so we have it is necessary for you to update the values of the real estate uh, properties in the same currency. So because Brazil has changed currencies many times, others for example, to add uh, variables, the numbers of bedrooms, the numbers of parking spaces in the garage, so that you can improve your accuracy by 10%. Notice that some uh, learnings, they can be automatic. And this author says this, that there is a great uh, 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 gap of research in this area, in this field of knowledge. And so, the summary of learnings and its effective use promotes the maturing of the team and also of the agency. And it stops this kind of knowledge from getting lost, okay? And so some guidelines here for us, for this methodology, for this proposal, this set of best practices, uh, being fast. Don't allow this documentation to happen at the end. It must be during the process, yeah? It, you have to do things at the right time and as soon as you do something. This proposal is adjusted, it can be adjusted. The professor from Goiânia used KDD, others use others. So you have to ad adapt and adjust and you need to complement things. It must be flexible because in practical terms, the quality of the documents is going to depend a lot on the team. The team respond for the veracity and truthfulness of the data. And at the beginning, maybe some work can have different criteria. And maybe uh, being able to replicate it must be important. And so I have to store the libraries. I have to store the numbers, random numbers. And so the methodology must be flexible. And it uh, must be used and possible to be used. Okay, so in Cladopi, 
all of my records, they were commands that I had for my laptop. Register the knowledge, register the information. And so I had a grid search and internally it already stored all of the trainings. And so illustration of the use, which is the CLADOP. I'm going to consider that you already know everything about CLADOP because my presentation this morning was all about CLADOP. And you can watch this on YouTube. And I'm going to show the use of the trace in CLADOP. And so here we have a summary of the learnings in my project. As you can see, some of them are automatically detectable, others are not. Unfortunately, after a few months, I got a sample of knowledge here and I started verifying. What is the percentage of the things that I still remember? And it surprised me that I would uh, I would even mention some things superficially, but in depth I only knew 27 percent. And so you have the infinite uh, uh, automatic hand. If you saw the the Avengers uh, movie, you remember this this artificial hand. And so the kit, the trace kit DM, and was 100 percent. And you had the hand of the future. Some of the definitions of the actions, uh, these are examples. And if in the literature we have a, a repetitive work, so on the 29th of May, I ignored a, a learning that I had, that the micro metrics, they were the same, they were fluid. And so my presentation was coming closer and closer and I programmed something again that I had already programmed. So it's useless uh, to, to only have the trace and not use it. You must use it. And so here uh, are the records of the trainings in all of the experiments. In blue, we have the parameters. In yellow, we have the metrics and the textual data. And all of these, when it comes to CloudDopy, they are stored in the same table. And these data allow us to have charts such as this one, the evolution month after month after month of the experiments. And so as you can see in November of 2018, when I started, I only had a few documents. And then I started copying the other documents where I was doing the trainings. And then you have the accuracy scale. So the greener it is, the more accurate is it is. And then you have all the techniques, all everything that I use. I have the results of the variables, the variables of context of all of the, the damages. And I also tested the quality of the OCR. So each training, and so this box plot has a set of trainings. And so we have several parameters here. And the best one was uh, in LPM. So it's important to have, and so this table here, so we have the versions of the CLADOP, the first one that was created on the first 21st of January, the last one on the 1st of July, and you can see the codes here. You can see the codes that were added to the training table. And so the last version that I created had 91.1% uh, of accuracy, And so in the generation of the build, I didn't separate data for tests, of course not. And this, uh, the information that is in the training table is very useful because I have a monitoring routine and it's already there in GitLab, uh, gitlab.com. And it, it is made available to all of you, it's public. And so, 
once you have the information and the par uh, parameters that you use, I can use it again, I can test it again. And so we have some metadata and we created an extra table and I can do this and send automatic emails and say, hey, what is the, the quality here? What is the minimum percentage? And so from the metadata, other benefits that we have is, is so if you foresee a report, how can you transform numbers into text or text into numbers? I apologize. And then you can have several charts with the parameters comparing the accuracy. And then you can have a table with your learnings, with your actions. And then you can have the report basically ready. This is also available to anyone on our website, gitlab.com. And this is the trace that the local files. So we had to create some regressors, some classifiers. And then we started using Excel spreadsheets, local files. And this is a good way to start. And so you have the classifica, the regrid. And so now the conclusions. Projects don't give you ropes. And so in the last month, so my final paper, according to my advisor, and then we inverted everything instead of talking about the Cladopi and also mentioning the documentation, we mentioned this. And so now you have the traces, right? So you have found a way. So so the the trace the dm trace the the trace kit dm is there on cloudop and i ask you what kind of documentation should be kept in your storage uh, area the processes or the product unfortunately some projects are not successful in the end they they do not have a product as their outcome but you can uh, store the processes. That kind of knowledge is going to be useful to everybody. But I believe you should store both. But many, many times, the most important is the process because life is a process. So this is a trail that I walked on with my son. And I wanted to take a picture of a spring here. But when we arrived there, there was so much vegetation that we didn't take a photo. But the path was beautiful. So the trace kit DM can also be a product of your project. So that uh, it's going to be available for research. And maybe there is value for your team to avoid reworking. And maybe it's a potential treasure. And maybe this is a simple step for any project, yes? And maybe it's going to be uh, wonderful for your organization to take a big step. And so uh, is the trace or does the trace belong to your agency? According to the literature, yes. But we cannot limit people's creativity. And so we cannot be turned into machines. And so I wish you all a good traceability and a good trace. So I'm going to invite the other panelists. We have 10 minutes for Q&As now. Sérgio and Fernando, please join me here on the stage. So Borelli still imagines that we are going to have uh, the possibility of retiring. Oh, you're so optimistic. I uh, OK, and you bring me hope. And no, we are not running away from the questions, OK? I'm just a messenger. I'm just a messenger. But I have some questions. We have some questions that you can ask uh, just using hashtag Brazil Digital. I'm going to start with, I wanted to ask the question, but there was a gentleman here that asked the question. Were new controls created by your process? He basically wants to know 
if there was some kind of assessment carried out by experts of the risk uh, indicators, risk indexes, and did they make sense? Yes. This is essential for all of the multi-criteria process. So if you don't have the support from the expert, you're not going to have the ratification of your factors. And so the process since the origin until its conclusion was followed up by four experts. And these re uh, experts ratified all of the factors. And as it was mentioned before, they ratify everything with the agents based on the questionnaire that we offered to the engineers. And we had about 50, 55 respondents. And so could this encourage new regulations and amendments to the law? Well, this is ongoing, OK? so. Not the law, not the law. The law is going to be amended. Or it can only be amended by the legislative branch. But we're amending it now, revising it now. And these perceptions, they must be incorporated. So the question is the effectiveness of the results. Testing a model, testing a model. And then it, it is becoming a decision-making tool within a nail, yes. And during the development of the model, I forgot to explain this, it was applied on top of the monitoring and surveillance campaigns, the previous ones. And we were able to validate this with a real experience. The question is for you, Fernando Pinhati. This is a complicated question. So the model of recommendation is really nice when it works out. And working out is like uh, the bank getting a good client and offering the credit. What about the, the banks that are not favorable? Uh, do they know this, this project? Was there a measuring of a bank that, theoretically speaking, would have had a higher number of contracts if model three was applied. Well, it took us six months to measure everything. And I didn't mention this during my presentation. And it took us a long time because we really wanted to uh, verify if the conversion metrics were impacting. And so these were the metrics that we shared with you, considering all the financial agents. So, so probabilistically speaking, it recommends to all of the financial agents. So nobody's complaining. And the other question is the A-B test, which is very interesting. We did something like this within a surveillance. But Eric's question is the following. Does this kind of test happen all the time? Is it uh, common for this kind of uh, uh, test of BNDS? Well, this team was uh, very new. And so we only have two teams, two teams. Well, uh, two teams is more than one. Yes, two is more than one. And this is good. The model is nice. And so this was the first a experience that we had with the A-B test. But there are other A-B tests that are ongoing now. And we are very happy with the results, and even for the channel. And we're waiting for uh, answers. And now I'm very curious. They're going to have to confess something to me. So there are people who work with data science within the IT department and within the base business department. And how do you see this? I see this very well with good, with, I am happy about it. And so uh, it's a model that is very interesting. And so we carry out the governance with the hybrid model. We have a, a little committee and data science has one person from with data 
analysis, one from the business department and one from the business itself. And so we make the decisions together. Which strategies are we going to adopt? Which projects are we going to conduct? And so it uh, makes our lives easier when it comes to an activity that depends a lot on knowledge and how the business works. And so we have been very successful at the, uh, the BNDES. And so, Sergio, does the same happen at ANEL? Does the same happen at ANEL? Yes. When it comes to the BNDES, it's been it's being disseminated now. Uh, in IT, in the other departments, we have been disseminating these concepts. And as our colleague mentioned, we have a set of civil servants that are being seduced by this work with data. But, but, but Ella, before I talk to you about the trace kit DM, but Ella, do you see that it, uh, uh, an advantage of having many, many data scientists working with this? Absolutely, everybody can contribute. But it's important for us to share information. We must share information. Yes, fantastic. So uh, Trace DM, Laura Solano also has a question for you, Borella. So is this uh, DM Trace a complement for the Trace? And do you recommend the use of them both? Yes, in fact, the Trace DM is complementary to any methodology. If you use CRISPR-TL, the, the guys from the University of HDD in Goiás. CRISP talks about documents in the activities. It may it asks you to register the decision in every activity. But the literature criticizes because it, it doesn't mention how you do it. And this interactivity of the tasks is not very well treated in these methodologies. So the documentation must be light throughout the project. I like something you mentioned, and it's funny. Your uh, um, tutor has three methods and has detailed knowledge of, the, of your project. What I can see in this documentation phenomenon is that it's quite useful as long as we have discipline and commitment. But what is the value that you give of, for a good talk during the process of creation of the project? I think it's also complementary to the trace. Yeah, it's really uh, key. The experience of uh, the experience of people is really fundamental. Given the descriptions and you categorize it, you automatically put it in a database. I can research and know that Wesley, for example, used tec technique such and such. Then I can go to your room and ask you, hey, how, how was the experience in that model? And then I can learn it with you. And since we are recording it, and let me ask a question, be careful with the answer. We can, can we use has through the Emmy? Can we use your, your, your uh, creation? Yes, of course, it's public. Uh, also the question, uh, I like to make it like this. Well, there's a question here from Rogério. Question to Borella. It's for, for Marcus, who's Marcus? What is the effort in terms of percentage of time of the project, in your opinion? This is a question for all of you. Well, uh, the trace has through the aim of trace. The, this methodology supposes abilities. So you, you will previously spend some time creating a routine in the tool, in the platform that you use. Uh, the way that you run the training in Python, it will in, be encapsulated in a, in a superior routine. It will pass as a parameter, and it will it will be saved automatically in the database. You will save it, and you will need a previous effort, maybe one day before, depending on how you want the trace, to be able to define this framework for documentation and documentation later is automatic you run the training you save the techniques the parameters that you used and it's up to you to re record the learning which are not automatic Sergio your project 
as I understood, is an object of uh, an academic analysis. So will it become a master's degree dissertation or post-graduation, or is it uh, research applied to an L? It's actually a result of, of a master's degree uh, dissertation. And, and I defended, we defended it uh, recently. And regarding the automation of process, it is being integrated to the corporate um, and corporate environment. And when we do this integration, I estimate that in two days you'll have the whole process running automatically and the documentation comes as a consequence. And no other agency looked for you to understand this method very well. Maybe another type of business can be uh, benefited from the fuzzy set. My master's degree happened, uh, was concluded in June, very recently, and this is the first moment I have to show this work to a, a greater public. So regardless of the dam safety, I see the flexibility of treating the criteria analysis and, and, and fuzzy sets, many other uh, man management process. So it is seen as a future work. Fernando, what about the percentage of documentation in, in the development bank? Well, normally we we do it in a, in a, in a scheme of software development, like scheme, yeah, it's agile, right? Really quick. Not, with, not without documentation of each sprint, we, we, it's packaged in the, in, the, in the delivery of the sprint. We have a complete cycle in each sprint. So it is in the directory. The percentage, it depends on what you consider the, the documentation, not only the, the paperwork with the rules, the exploration of data, it would be the product of data science or research product. It's going to be mixed, maybe 20% in the total. Since since we talked about being agile, just to get to know a little more the, the bank, uh, the, this um, methodology is very, very well used there. Yes, there was a growth for people who have worked a lot with a lot of the education and uh, the, the team with traditional software development, and we also work with data science. And even for audit planning, as Ricardo mentioned yesterday afternoon, we are using the, the, this, the, this method. Yes, everyone is using it. Well, we are exactly in the moment of, the, of coffee break. Is there any coffee for people there? So I'm going to ask the last question. It's a question from Laura. You're asking many questions. You're going to get a present for that. So regarding the projects, we you use uh, gitlab.com. My uh, my co course conclusion uh, work is there in the in the library. So you just ha you search Hasubotela. And people didn't ask about your grades in your in your dissertation uh, presentation. What was your grade of this course conclusion? But okay, l let's not talk about that. Well, no more questions uh, left. Let's like to thank Sergio uh, Fernando Mark. Sorry about the jokes, and thank you so much. Let's go to the break now. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So let's honor those people here who already have uh, secret vacancies in the workshops. No, this is not going to happen. So if you were able to register to take the workshops, you're not going to receive any confirmation of this, OK? And so if you registered yourself, you already know that you're going to be there. And so your uh, registration is only valid up to uh, 15 minutes before the workshop. And so 10 minutes before the workshop, if people have not, uh, have not uh, registered or appeared, they're going to open up the waiting list. And so those who are registered here, you have to come in advance. And if you are not registered, and so you can come a little earlier and try out to, uh, to take part, OK? Now let's start our last panel of the seminar. 
And I'm going to pass the floor to our mod moderator now. So now we're going to have data and automation panel. And the first presentation is going to be automatic public biddings without human intervention uh, by uh, the processing of geolocated tax information. And I would like to invite Mr. Aguinaldo Macedo Vilho from the State Court of Accounts from the state of Paraíba. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to know that this is an international seminar and there is a simultaneous translation. And so I'm going to speak with my accent from my state. And I believe you're going to be able to understand me. Yes? So before I start, I would like to highlight what surprised me a lot from yesterday what happened yesterday. It was the courage with which the people who are here, they are dealing with disruption. So in fact, we are coming to the conclusion that we are facing bureaucratic problems and bringing solutions from outside the public administration that, uh, that work really well with us, even if we are making several people unhappy and knowing all of the normative work that we're going to have to submit ourselves to. So yesterday, we had two examples. And so, uh, ah, we had the app of taxis. So taxis to reduce the cost, to have more control. And many suppliers, they became upset because of this. And so uh, we want to suggest and changes in this uh, format, how we can uh, understand. And I was, I was complimenting Gustavo about this because of the courage he had in this project. Imagine how many people are going to be impacted by this and everything that he's going to have to face. But if we're not brave enough, the project is not going to move forward. And so just because everybody who's here already has this courage and they have started their projects, I have already seen a very big advance. So I would like to congratulate all of you. I'm going to go a little faster because I have a little time. But is it possible to have an automatic uh, public bidding without the participation of auctioneers and people taking part? Well, this project is subdivided into three phases. The first part I'm going to share with you so that you, we can understand the key ideas. So it, it, this was launched in the state of Paraíba, but it was created by the people in Rio Grande do Sul, in Rio Grande do Sul. And then possibly we're going to see this in every uh, state in Brazil. And the second one, it's not a novelty, but there are some nuances. And the third one, n nobody can have an electronic public bidding, even if they have a robust system that works pretty well and achieves this goal. It's impossible because it's illegal. And so you must follow the legislation that we have. And it is a federal legislation, so it's difficult to change. And this week, it was a coincidence. Well, actually, in the last few weeks, there is a new public bidding law, and it's moving forward. And so uh, regarding advances, there is nothing. It only restructured all the bureaucracy. But there is no technology that was brought into the public bidding process. And it's a, a bill of law of 1995, over 20 years ago. And so uh, what would be necessary to have an electronic public bidding? So we have the prices. It's not public bidding data, data from the market. And so uh, via partnership with ACEFAS, we were able to achieve all of the electronic invoices of Paraíba. 
and uh, invoices uh, from paper boxes to uh, brand new cars. And this partnership was to develop first this app that I'm going to show to you on the screen so that you can understand this very well, very well. Aqui. Se eu digitar... If I type uh, any word... I need. Just a second, please. Okay. Se eu digitar All right, if I type Heine, uh, as a matter of fact, I wanted to I, I wanted to um, consult the mayonnaise, but I only got beers. This is a consultation of uh, invoices, uh, the database of invoices of the most popular uh, items with this keyword. If I check the, the first one, it will provide the cheapest uh, beer sold in the past 72 hours. If I if I ask for the most recent, it will bring me something like seven minutes ago. So it's almost real time, all the products that were sold in, in the state of Paraíba. So it's six billion records per year available in this app. And I also can make a list, for example, for barbecue. I write four items and I run it, and then it brings five most, uh, five cheapest restaurants in the city, uh, five cheapest uh, supermarkets in the city. So this was just for you to understand where the data come from. This app is already available. And now I will talk about the second one, which is not for the citizens. It's for the procurement sectors of all the city halls of the state of Paraíba and also the government of, of the state of Paraíba. In October uh, 15, we're going to launch a panel where they will generate reference prices to include in the bidding processes. O on this basis, with market prices, it's not bidding prices. So I'm going to get this example. Of uh, va uh, coffee in vacuum, vacuum package, it's, uh, 250 grams. There you go. I got two examples of uh, bidding processes executed in the countryside of the state of Paraíba. The same specification, uh, roasted coffee packed in, in the vacuum, 250 grams. So we have two city halls here. This is not uh, bidding, it, it is uh, the, the market price. So I have here the coffee, uh, for, uh, 550 for 70, 430, and then I run the, the app, and then I get 350, and it's the same specification, 350, 370, so I, it was raised from 350 in average and on the market to 450 in the public administration. And this price price is the price for the units, the, and the price for the 
uh, public agencies is uh, the scale prices. Another example, this one is permanent. We have air conditioning, so we have 9,000 BTUs with a remote control. And so for the public administration, so it's 1,475 and 48 cents in average. In the, on the app, 1,033. So any person that you ask, so why do we have this? It's going to give you the right answer. Ah, the law is extremely bureaucratic. The supplier is afraid of not being paid. It takes a long time for being paid. And they need to have a lot of cash flow, a high cash flow. And so they increase the price. And so they increase the price. And so there is a, a budget that is requested or an estimate. They use the, the, the bidding price, and we are working on the bidding price, and it's a snowball. So what we propose is let's start working with the real prices. And so the law was created 26 years ago. And so the public bidding has to base on the prices that are being used within the public administration. Why? OK, this is a norm. I don't even know if it's still in effect. And so afterwards, you're going to assess the, the prices on the panel of prices. And you're also going to base yourself on similar biddings. So the focus is entirely on type of public prices, bidding prices. Why? So if they have this extra fat or this extra amount just because they are afraid of not being paid, but the law also says that the government has to base its prices uh, on the prices that are uh, practiced in the national market. And so if there is a price aligned with the market, then you can buy it. So what is my, my main objective here? This is the panel, how it works, how the, the bidding committee works, and then they're going to choose 10, 15 products, and then they're going to have the public bidding and so it's going to create uh, barcodes for all of the products. And so this is where we have all the work, all the work. I have already talked to the people from Rio Grande do Sul, a state in the south, south in Brazil, to improve this. So th we can make things easier. And then they can choose four products. And among these products, we can have a reasonable list of barcodes. And so products that are uh, in the market, então, uh, they have this in the places. And so we are going to have the reference price. We have one million statistics behind this. We have economics professors with us. And the certificate, finally, the certificate. The certificate must be printed and included in the bidding process. So if an auditor questions everything, and then you're going to see if that's true or not. So this is the last screen of the system. This is a real case. I got coffee and sugar. So ground coffee, 250 grams. And so an individual is going to pay 359. Uh, a company is going to pay 299. And the public sector is going to pay 533. This is not right. This is not right. And we cannot blame the bureaucracy. We cannot blame the law because the supplier is going to be afraid of not being paid and the, the, the payments are going to be delayed. We have to fight against this. And so for all of the items that we are mentioning, we are not considering services, only products, because services uh, generate invoices in each municipality, municipality, and it's humanly impossible for you to consider all of the invoices and store them. And so you can store the, the taxes the taxes. So the federal government, the state governments, the municipal governments, OK? And everything here can be, we can try to find the prices by using the barcodes of the items. So we have uh, cello tape, glue, coffee, 
uh, pens, uh, files, sugar, plastic cups. And so the, the, the taxpayers, they have to include the barcode of the medication. So uh, fuels and medication, they have this uh, special feature. And the law gives us 30 days to pay the supplier. Because in 1993, we didn't have an internet, most. And so we needed, we needed this for a long time. And uh, we started adapting ourselves, adjusting ourselves to the 30 days. Sometimes they pay on the last day or they f ignore this deadline of 30 days. And they want to charge fines and interest rates if the the public administration doesn't want to, uh, to allow this and assessment you have no retrofeeding of the assessment of the the products so the committee goes there and gives a, a score and there's no retrofeeding so in this process we need the retrofeeding um, uh, between the partners so i'm going to assess the supplier but the supplier can assess me they can give me uh, a score one if i take a long time to pay so uber uber 2.5 2.7 uh, if they have the score are you gonna take it are you gonna use it no and so he's not gonna use to an agency that uh, receives a score of 2.3 and this is an example so we have uh, suppliers we have government agencies we have civil servants and we have products so any public agency in brazil they can they should retrofeed the quality of the services and then we're going to have fairer public meetings. And I'm going to talk about this. And so the public bidings, they are delayed. And most of them have all of this uh, automatized, automated. And I ask a question. Law number 13303 only asks half of these qualifications to sell to the government. Why can they have public bidings that is fast, that are faster, more economical, and the 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 government cannot? Well, what do we propose? Let's have a reference term the same way, but use the prices to describe the specifications in GTIN's uh, reports. So it's like the barcode, and so the robot is going to implement the electronic bidding uh, based on the barcodes. And this is not an infinite list. And it's very easy for it to start having pilot projects with uh, cleaning products, medication, uh, and permanent uh, uh, products, uh, vehicles, air conditioning. And then you're going to have you're going to have a complete list of all of the barcodes of every single kind of product you buy. And then the public bidding committees, they won't have this uh, hard work again. And so this is a suggestion that was of the methodology. Before the public bidding, there should be a window, a 24-hour window, for the potential suppliers of that uh, public notice to add barcodes that were not uh, contemplated by the public bidding committee. After 24 hours, nobody's going to complain anymore, and the robot can do all the work. And so all of the study that is being done uh, based on the less sales, where? Only in the cities, only in the regions. Is it all over the country? Otherwise, I'm going to have the wide competition uh, principle. The main, this is the last phase, but it has to be super well structured before this. So the winners and those who are interested, they are going to receive a communication on their apps. And they're going to have 24 hours to accept. And then we're going to have a list of those who accepted, and so on and so forth. And so the uh, enablement process is going to be automatic. And we're going to have a retrofeeding. What was the quality of the supplier? What was the quality of the product? And also the quality of the agencies that are signing the, the procurement contracts. 
And to conclude, I just want to say in 2019, between the 15th of October and the end, we're going to have a three-month simulation of all of the public bidding's of all of the city halls in the state of Paraíba that are going to sell products and that we can classify. And I'm going to do the to, from. And so, look, how much money could the city halls have saved if they had uh, had electronic public biddings and if they had considered the real price charged in the market, not the public bidding prices? So when I have this document, we're going to create a methodology of how this can truly be implemented, and it's not a system. I cannot create a system. I cannot create a robot unless I have the, the, the stipulation in the law to do that, the stipulation in the law. And so I'm going to have the project on paper, all of the story, all of the, the documents, all of the support. Where is it? It's going to go to the legislation. It's going to go to the legislation. And so we can start talking and to treat this idea to see, it, does this make sense? Does this make sense or people from Paraíba are totally crazy? And to wrap up, the two main points. So we want the economy to happen gradually as time goes by, but with the retrofeeding. And so the, the legal provisions are going to be guaranteed. We want to have fair public biddings based on the quality of the suppliers and also quality of the products purchased. And so since uh, my time is over, this is kind of of the architecture of the app. We're using Parquet. We're using because it considers 72 hours of data. And so we have the Parquet, and it's running on R to do the ATL every five minutes. And this is the, the, the time we have to receive the data from ACFAS. But for the, the price table that is going to be used by the government, so since we're going to consider two years of data, and I'm talking about uh, millions and millions of records, we are already using the Hadoop distributed file system. And we're also using Spark. Okay, so this is what I had to share with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Agnaldo. Next pre presentation is the record linking and linkage for databases and uh, post-market registration for biological medication. Monica Cavalho Soares from Anvisa. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to be here sharing this presentation with you. My name is Monica Suarez, and I would like to use this, these uh, 20 minutes to share with you the potentials of the databases of the National Agency of uh, Sanitary Surveillance. This work was focused on the databases of registration and post uh, registration, that is pre-market and post-market at our agency on Visa and it env envisions a systemic look for the products uh, uh, regarding uh, 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 health surveillance. I'd like to know before anything, I'd like to, you to tell me um, how, how many of you took any medication last month? Please raise your hand. So, I think this presentation will will be uh, of will bring sensibility to you all. This work was developed in a collaboration with the University University of Maryland and the University of Rio de Janeiro and the National School of Public Health. 
Well, our agency, Anvisa, has the scope, a very a broad scope of regulation. It relates directly with health of Brazilian population. So all this information of all these products, they are information that are sub subjected to the evaluation of the technical body of Anvisa, and they are kept in our databases to promote the uh, manager re reports, also information regarding analysis um, deadlines. There's a big demand f from us in regarding the, this, um, that these deadlines. And we use also it to manage our regulation actions in the pre and post market. Well, and what is the pre market and post market? Pre-market is the registration, something that is not yet in the analysis of registration. It was not uh, brought to the population. So we call these uh, uh, safety and effectiveness of the medication, quality of the medication. Also, we, we analyze cost and effectivity. It regards the price of the medication. In the post-market, the product goes through actions such as inspection so we can monitor the quality of the medication and also it goes through the monitoring of the notifications of uh, side effects or collateral effects that the medication might bring to people. Well, in we increase in the post-market increasingly is increasingly being up, uh, enhanced all around the world. The look to the post-market has been a reality in the US, in Europe, in Japan, in Canada. And they are u using this data to generate information, to increase the regulatory evidence, and to bring subsides to the decision uh, making in the regulatory aspect. We are going from a model that is regulated to a data-centered model. Just for you to have an idea, the FDA in the United States is started in 1906. So we are not that old, but we are also in the direction of the use of data to make regulatory decisions. So all these approaches that are being discussed during the Food and Drug Administration, uh, which is our um, brother in the U.S. And we also use big data and uh, data mining. This is uh, an international discussion, and Brazil is, in, is included in this discussion. Well, the pre-market encompasses the registration of the medication. We need to guarantee and contribute for the medication to get to the population has efficacy and uh, quality and safety. Within this analysis, we have two uh, essential evaluations. The first one is the manufacturing process. Uh, I have seen, uh, when we talk about process, uh, what, what I saw in the presentations here is very different from what we have there. So we are talking about the size of the batch, the, the manufacturing conditions and, and uh, facilities, the equipment that is used to make the, this medication. So all this is analyzed in the registration analysis, the good practices of uh, manufacturing and the product itself, the active principle that is used in the medication that you, ladies and gentlemen, take. The recipient, the formulations, all the conservatives, uh, all the preservatives and the product. And Visa will say, will balance the entrance and approve or not the entrance of the product in the market. Once it is approved, we want to take the population out of that situation of morbidity, of illness, and aggregate health to the Brazilian citizens. To, we want to add health, life quality, and well-being to, to the population. Once the med medication is approved, it is in the post-market, so it uh, starts a new type of uh, evaluation and inspection, which is the, uh, regarding the 
um, side effects and why do we monitor the medication in the post market because we need to guarantee that it is always this way uh, medication that will add health and not the opposite not in the other direction uh, that is medication causing uh, side effects and cause other types of morbidity in our regulatory market in our actions in the market we can identify how the population Brazilian population has been receiving our regulatory actions but medication is not is not something stuck the moment that it is registered throughout its life it suffers what we call post registration alterations the pharmaceutical company registers the, the medication and right after that this medication suffers changes or alterations what type of of changes it can be different ways in uh, changes in the process the ph pharmaceutical company moves from one place to another or in the manufacturing process like the size of, of the batch the recipient the expiring date the decrease in the expiring date the increase of preservatives so in almost 100% it happens in almost 100% of the reality of the medications that we we take after the medication is uh, registered they start making the, the alterations so when we talk about lifespan of the medication we need to consider all this the pre-market the registration the renewals of the registration and also consider all this movement that happens in the post registration and in actions such as the notification of side effects the goal of this work then is to obtain a, a database with the systemic vision of the lifespan of the medication which encompasses the registration and the notifications of side effects what we call the pharmacosurveillance uh, database also to integrate the data of the patients to this analysis of the lifespan of the medication so we studied 2,434,169 processes of registers and post registers and 93,391 notifications of uh, side effects to integrate such data we use the methodology of data linkage which consists on connecting one or more independent databases that must have common variables with this it allows the establishment of only one database containing variables of different databases having this our pilot project we had a, a cut in the biological medications not only what what was brought to the, the medi medic medicine like the treatment of cancer and rare diseases the biological medications are the ones generated by biological products including the ones in our own body and also the specificity of these products in the manufacturing process so to test uh, the part of our methodology we wanted to start from something that we had data in the literature and the data in the literature for literature for biological products are quite robust uh, giving uh, information on the sensibility of the manufacturing process of these products so we started to study the variables of the registration uh, database and as you can see we have a high number of variables of registration and post registration that we used to, to be able to identify our connection keys to unite these databases we did an analysis of the registration database and the database of the phar pharmacovigilance they are notification coming from hospitals but you ladies and gentlemen can go to the website of Anvisa and uh, do your notification using the um, uh, health surveillance system and then we it's called Vigimed so the database is divided in three information pillars one 
related to the uh, side effects, the information regarding side effects for the technician of Anvisa can say, to be able to say that this event is, uh, is or is not related to the medication, if the side effect was serious or not, and all the other information regarding the side effects. If it was a mistake uh, uh, in medication, prescription, the dosage, and another important pillar is the information of the product. Many times that when the population does a notification of side effects, just to have an idea, how many of you here have notified a side effect in your whole life? Could you, were you able to do it? Well, you have this possibility, so it's important for us to feed this database, including the data of the population and not only the hospitals. This information of the product and the company of the patients uh, is used so for us to locate the patient. Uh, when we monitor, we can recover the information and help the patient. So the information of the pharma pharmacovigilance uh, is used for this. And regarding the uh, phases of the database linkage, we have three phases. The phase one included the understanding of the variables, and then there was the data cleanup, which is really important to do this part, and then the standardization. The second step was the database linkage, that is, the variables index, the identification of the connection keys among these databases, the grouping, and the merge or matching. And the last step was the analysis of results. This is a diagram just to show you. It's a schematic diagram to illustrate how this linkage was done, the linkage of this database. So we got, we got the general database, which is the database of data visa that contains information of registration and post-registration. In the first linkage, we used we only used the name of the product because we wanted to have a test first. So we only used the name of the product. We got the primary base of registration, the total base. And in the secondary base, we used the biological products that, that uh, underwent um, changes in, in the post-approval phase. Why didn't I get the uh, biological uh, products in the, in the in the primary base and only in the second in the secondary base? Because we, in this case, we could uh, understand the database better. And what happens is the biological medication, many of them were primarily registered as similar medication, and throughout the time, they were they changed the classification for biological products. So to maximize the rights and minimize the wrongs, we did it this way. We created this magnet, which are the biological products that suffered uh, uh, alterations after registration. And this magnet uh, captured all the biological products in the primary base. With this, I did the pairing of registration, biological products paired with the biological products of, of that were altered uh, in the post-registration. And now this is my magnet. It will capture the biological products product of the database of pharmacovigilance. And then we have the record, biologicals that were registered, biologicals that changed after the registration, and compared to the biologicals that had that had adverse effects or side effects. And so we had the, uh, the creation of a single database for studies. And so the first information that we had is that among the two million uh, uh, processes, two million 
429,000, they are after the registration, and only 188,000 uh, at the registration. So you can see the amount of information that come from the processes after the, the registration of the medication. And so our match, we we did the cleaning up, we did the clustering, and we were able to match 520 biological products with 520 of the post-registration. And among the 520, when we compare this to the pharmacovigilance database, we identified 6,139 adverse effects, uh, effect notifications. And so we created another trial because now we could move a little further. We adjusted everything. We adjusted everything and we analyzed the product. But our relationship is with the uh, pharmaceutical company. So we had a second case using the product manufactured by company X. So company X and product X linked to product Y. This became my connection key. And when we use not only the, uh, the connection key uh, of the product, but also of the company, we had 577, and they were connected to 5,468 adverse effect notifications. So we analyzed the notifications or of adverse effects, and so we had 61% of the notifications that were uh, obtained from this matching. 61%, they were considered to be serious uh, 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 notifications, type A and type B. The type A is related to the dose, and the type B, they are called notifications. They don't know the origin. Uh, they are idiosyncratic, so it's impossible to detect this kind of uh, side effect in a clinical trial. And so what is may be causing this uh, side effect of type B? We have several examples in the literature, and the type B is the main reaction that removed the medications from the market, and they are the ones that are deeply studied and more studied because we try to avoid this kind of side effect. Among the, the adverse effects, 98% were related to the medication. And so when we carried out our multivariable, multivariable analysis of the notifications with the alterations post-registration, what were the results we obtained? that alterations in the manufacturing process, they are more related to a higher number of notifications of side effects. And so it, this was commented at the beginning, the sensitivity of the biologicals when it comes to, uh, to the manufacturing process. This kind of alteration in the manufacturing process was also responsible for the highest number of serious notifications, and it was also uh, looking at the regression coefficient for the highest number of type B reactions or effects. So emphasizing that we must study these data a little deeper when it comes to biologicals and their notifications and post-registration alterations. And as conclusions, and so uh, analyzing the medications the post, uh, in the post-registration phase in general, with this work, we were able to identify which biologicals in the post-market they had notifications of adverse effects and relate them to the post-registration alterations that these products uh, underwent during their life cycle and that the alterations, the process alterations, they were more critical in terms of number of notifications, seriousness, and type B notifications. So these studies are strategic to analyze the health uh, risk 
and uh, uh, these studies uh, also increase the efficiency of the analysis and they try to optimize the productive process and to reduce costs. And so we are adding more efficiency to our analysis by using the information, the data information that we have. And also adding more value because now we can study other paradigms related to the notifications and also the post-registration changes and to uh, optimize the productive process because the companies would like to have access to these data to study that. Of course, they do not want to uh, manufacture products that are uh, constantly generating notifications of side effects. So it's a win-win situation. The population wins, the manufacturer wins, and the regulatory agency also wins. And so we have a reduction of costs. So the main reason for the reduction, uh, the reduction in the number of people sticking to their treatment is because of the side effects. So with this, I would like to conclude the, my, uh, my, my presentation. And this study points to the importance of the linkage of data as an instrument so that you can have regulation based on evidence. And we can also integrate patient data to the central strategy of our analysis. So thank you very much for your attention. Now let's continue. The next uh, presentation is going to be uh, tech segmentation, similarity in optimizing bulk document analysis, and the name of the, the speaker is Marcel Milsand. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about natural language processing, NLP, just to to I have already changed many of my slides, but I promise it's going to be a little different. Maybe you're going to be able to help me more than me informing you because you have had so many uh, presentations about this. So my name is Marcel Musin. I am an inspector at the CVM. And I am at the Department of Processes. And I'm also part of the Intelligence and Investigation uh, Department. And so these are my, and so I have, so my, my project is still very incipient. We're still just beginning. Our department is new, but our problems are old. As we saw yesterday, the amount of texts that we receive is uh, humongous. Some of them cannot be uh, converted by using the OCR. And the fonts are different, the sizes are different, the formats are different. And it's my department that carries out the deepest analysis. And sometimes we need to extract relevant information. And sometimes uh, sets of text such as this so that we can use the relevant information. And we're going to use this as evidence in our uh, reports. Maybe it is to accuse somebody of a crime or to sue somebody for a crime. And so what did we think? The initial proposal was the following, to apply the text corpus and to use natural language processing and machine learning, non-supervised machine learning, to see if by doing this, we can facilitate the path ahead of the analysts, of the civil servants, once they have to analyze this huge amount of texts and so that they can find the relevant information that they need to find. And this is the initial problem that we're dealing with. And I'm going to show to you how we try to do this. And please uh, feel free to make suggestions. Yes, I'm open to suggestions.
I don't think that this is my presentation. Just, just a minute. I changed a few things on my slides. É essa, porque eu adaptei o que a gente faz atualmente, né? Muitas coisas que a gente faz no pré-processamento acabam sendo é, 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 muita da vontade do freguês, né? O que precisa ser feito, se precisa tirar dígitos, se você precisa tirar é, caracteres latinos. No nosso caso, o que a gente faz é, é basicamente na parte de NTK, a remoção da pontuação, das stop words, a tokenização e a redução radical, que é o stem, né? Não vou, não vou esquecer do, do, do processamento de OCR lá em cima. O colega do MPF já mencionou ontem o IPED da Polícia Federal. A gente está usando ele lá. Na verdade, a gente, isso veio depois de a gente começar a usar o IPED. É, tem que ser é, 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 exaltado, é open source. A gente conseguiu fazer funcionar. Ele faz esse pré-processamento para a gente, já indexa todos os documentos faz o CR quando é necessário e põe numa pasta lá de text, onde a gente consegue depois extrair tudo para depois fazer o, o, o processamento do NLP com eles. Ah, depois a gente processa parte para a parte de vetorização. Né? A gente, vou passar um pouco mais rápido nessa fase. A gente tem preferência também pelo TFDF, que faz aquela, é, aquela é, é, pesagem, né? Ela dá preferência aos, aos, aos tokens da frequência no documento, mas penaliza quando, no, a frequência do corpo total. A gente usa 1 a 3 N gramas, que a gente acha que consegue captar um pouquinho mais de significado quando a gente junta é, um. Imagine that this is going to explode our matrix. Yes, among all of the possibilities. And so there is a limit for the most important ones, the 100,000 most important terms. And so we have the matrix, the sparse matrix uh, generated. And so you have documents per 100,000 uh, features. After that, we are able to do the similarity by cosine, by the cosine. So similarity by the cosine, it measures the distances between the vectors in the space. And the, the higher the cosine, the more similar the terms are. And so you can use this with documents as well. So in this case, it's very simple because we already have the TF uh, LDF. And so you can do the cosine very easily because you can multiply the TF uh, LDF matrix by itself and then it's going to have a squared matrix with all of the similarities. And so we, there's no way of showing some documents because they are the classified, but we have a practical example here with a smaller data set, and it's good to find it. It's easy to use it using the T, uh, LTK, using the inaugural speeches of the American presidents uh, from Eisenhower in 53 until Obama in 2009. Nine. And so it's a huge matrix, as you can see. And you have, uh, if you have all of these data, you're able to use a BI tool, and you're going to select the first text. And after that, it's going to filter everything based on the similarities in the second text. And so it's going to rank everything for you based on similarity from one text to the other. And so. Uh, so if we have a complaint or evidence or proof that you find relevant, then you would be able to, and this is what we aim to have, so you have text that you should read. It's like a recommendation. You should read this text. And we also bet at the beginning in clustering, always going from the simpler to the most difficult, and this could uh, give us some insight or to give uh, some insight to the civil servants. The good thing about the clustering is that it uses the TF uh, LDF matrix 
And I believe somebody mentioned this morning that uh, regarding the features, it was difficult for them to generate the clustering. For us, it was not difficult, at least with the k-means. With the GMM, it, it was a little difficult. Our computers, they got stuck. And so some of them, they were similar to the k-means. So we, started, we continued using the k-means. And so using the silhouette core, to say how many segments we believe are valid. And so it is a cohesion uh, uh, variable. And so the mean, the higher the mean, theoretically speaking, the number of segments would be the uh, more appropriate. So this is the real data set. We're not going to discuss this with you deeply, but just to show you the clustering that happened. So we have five segments here, all of these colors. Uh, they are not very different, but they are on the screen. They are not very different, but they are truly different. And so we have the PCA uh, of three dimensions so that we could plot everything here on the screen. And here we already see a problem to give this to the civil servants because this was uh, done with Plotly. It is a BI uh, tool that we use uh, to use uh, batches of data. And so in the Python, Visual doesn't accept this very well. So if anybody understands here of JavaScript, and it would be good for you to already know how to do the customized visualizations. And please talk to me. Come to me and chat with me. So within the research, we started trying to evolve. So TFDF has some criti criticisms when it comes to the capture of semantics. And we started using uh, Doc2Vec. And so with uh, word embedding. And then we went to Doc2Vec. And we wanted to assess the documents themselves. So Doc2Vec is a generalization of Word, word Vec. Word2Vec. OK, so Doc2Vec is a, a generalization of the Word2Vec. It has a fixed architecture and a hidden uh, layer. I will not talk a lot about that now, but uh, there is a parameter that we could not uh, use it very very much yet, which is the window of similarity that you you aim to have. It's one of the parameters that you set when you use DocVec, Doc2Vec. But what happened to Doc2Vec? After you generate the vectors, uh, that in this case is the documents, you choose the size of the, doc the documents and you can have you can choose a similarity by cosine input the algorithms supervised and non-supervised you record the model and then when you have other models other documents in the da data set other words uh, actually you can do the increment of this model in our case it's really important because we are still working in with the old cases the old cases are complete already. At CVM, we don't get all the documents of the process in the same at the same time. You have a diligence. You request for it. You issue a document. You do the inspections. You request documents. So it must be done uh, in, a, in an incremental form. We are in the first phase of DocFed 2, so we didn't implement it, not even to test, because it provided some strange results because we don't have a lot of experience with it. And what happened was in the same da data set of the clustering, it, it was divided by five in TFDF, TFDF and it was, uh, we thought it, it would trace better limits and would capture the semantics, but it was divided only by two. I cannot show you the documents exactly, but we saw that it didn't make a lot of sense in the type of in the type of division that it made. So we compared the similarity by cosine of TFDF, 
in, uh, in the following way. We ran doc to vec like a bit search, like a grid search, and the times of number of times of training, uh, and we com uh, compared the indexes of the 20 largest similarities of each text, and we crossed it, and we see the coincidence between the two of them. So this coincidence varied um, of six. Uh, 0.65 and up to 8.41. So it was a coincidence for us, which was low for us. It must, it might be low because Doc2Vec is much better than TFDF, but we could not run with other parameters for us to have this certification in parallel to this. Also, we could not have references that indicate the use of Doc2Vec in long documents, we had the presentation of our colleague from uh, from Unseen, and it brings us an interesting suggestion uh, about this. If you get the vector of the words and multiply it by the TFDF, but we didn't do this. We will think of doing it now, for sure, and we could not establish it very well. It is valid for us if it if it if it was valid for us or not. Uh, there are documents in our data sets that are really long, over 1,000 pages, and we are we're not sure if that in that case our parameters are adjusted for this type of evaluation. The current moment of the project is this: we used corpus of old cases, the OCR. It was done by I. Uh, um, EPED, TFDF, with a, a cosine similarity and the uh, segmentation uh, by k-means and the silhouette Scott to measure. The next steps that we think are the real cases, the current real cases, and we see we want to see the difficulties we're going to have. Uh, some type of evaluation, quantitative evaluation of the of these cases. It, it is non-supervised at the moment, and so it's hard for us to have this evaluation. And we think that the quantitative indicator of that 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 is successful has to go through the economy of time that the server will have to instruct that process and to have. Conviction. We also, as you can, as you could see, we really love uh, visualization. We want to keep uh, having these insights of visualization, and how we are going to offer that to the server. And what, what is in the pipeline of thoughts is the last line: the similarity among tests to model the similarities. Thinking of a chart. In uh, thinking of uh, of it as a network, because we are talking about relationships among entities, so that could be a network of nodes. Uh, the nodes in this case are the documents. So just to give you the an idea of the visualization, it's the same data set. The color is not very good, but it is modeled like this using the 20 great, biggest similarities up down to the 20th biggest similarity as something to modulate the graph. Here it is the same one but it's colored by the colors of segmentation and clustering. We still don't know where we're going to reach with this, but it's we know it's something that may provide us some good results in the future. We hope uh, we will have interesting suggestions for us. Thank you for your attention. Now the last presentation of this panel and this seminar, the, which is 
The Review of Modern Natural Language Processing with Deep Learning Implications by Eric Mozart from TCU. Good afternoon. We all have seen several presentations in the past days. Um, seven or eight of them were related to NLP, and many of them also used NLP indirectly. So you are all quite familiar with what is NLP, how to apply it, and the difficulties. My presentation will be focused in the next steps. What can be done with NLP? What has to be done with um, NLP? And what is being developed in the labs, the new fun functionalities of technology? Here, a quick dis uh, disclosure. Uh, this is what is being presented here is my own opinion, not the opinions of my um, agency. We, the goal is to describe applications of the state of our, the art of NLP, identify new opportunities, expand the vision and the potential of the NLP, and how to bring capacity to the modern uh, NLP. NLP can affect different phases of the data generation. So initially, you can have voice capturing. It is hard, a little hard to visualize. Once you get the voice, you can make it um, transform into text, which is a, a speech recognition. And also, you can tr make it into a semantic uh, transformation that brings meaning to the text. Uh, when you have the semantic representation, you can produce the text and a synthesis of words uh, from the text. These are these fi phases two and five work very well, and the uh, automatic conscription and sy synthetic voice really works very well. The automatic conscription, uh, the error rate is really low, and also we have elements that generate voice from the text with the level of quality that people cannot distinguish between the synthetic voice and the human voice. The great challenge still is on how to build the semantic representation uh, from the text and how to generate new text from the semantic representation. So we're going to focus on this part. All we mentioned regarding NLP uh, represents different applications. So I will not repeat the applications. I'll just focus on the challenges. We saw it is that it is hard to do NLP because it's hard to deal with the ambiguity uh, uh, issues. Polysemy, with like one word has different meanings, and also synonyms, big problems with the, the knowledge uh, of the world. We have a text talking about something, but the text is not alone is not enough. You need to have other information on how the world works or the uh, the, domin the, mind, the meaning, uh, the domination of knowledge. Also is the mindset of the speaker. What is in the text has to be, can be indirect. You have to understand uh, what the character of a certain novel is saying to understand what it is said in a, in a situation. Also the issue of empathy and common sense. How can you quantify common sense? Many projects attempted to do it, showing uh, rule, sets of rules. But when you when you write even one million of rules, you, you don't reach uh, common sense. So it is really difficult to dimension and to define through rules. In the past two years, more intensively the past six months, there has been a revolution of NLP. The qualitative leap that made that was made possible recently is really incredible. The comparison uh, to what we, is do is being done is uh, compared to the computational uh, vis uh, vision. It went through a qualitative leap uh, about five years ago. The computational vision, in which the use of algorithms of deep learning and transfer of learning allowed. Uh, that human limits of uh, performance and vision were reached. And similar things are happening now with NLP. So I will quickly talk about learning transfer. Basically, you train your 
model in a corpus, in a, in a set of texts, and it has the advantage of not being labeled. You don't need labels explaining your text. It generates uh, supervised activities, extracting labels from the text itself, such as predicting the next uh, sent, uh, sentence or the next word. You have a text, and it tries to guess the next word only analy by analyzing the previous words. So this task is called language model. You have the comprehension of the language that, language that is so good that you can guess what will be the next uh, word with a high rate of um, co uh, right of accuracy using the rules of language and also the understanding of what is being written in the text. Once you create a language model using text without labels, your model learned the basic element of language. When you use this trained model with a set of texts and another specific task, for this new task, you can have a set of, uh, an unlimited set of texts. And still, you'll be able to have a very good performance. So this is the idea of learning transfer. You learn with the domain, you use the knowledge extracted by this domain in a new domain. Uh, the, the closer the domains are, better is the transference. If they are too distant, the transferring is not so good. The learning models that use uh, learning transfer were quite successful in terms of um, performance. And it, in, 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 a, in, a short, in, in a short time, uh, period of time, in the past months, a sequence of new models had a, a growing uh, growth, even um, overcoming the human uh, performance regarding text uh, comp understanding. And then comes the question, how do you know your model is good at treating language? You need to standardize the tasks that are interesting to you. You get these tasks, you if I evaluate your model to carry out that task. What is discovered recently is that the understanding of language itself helps the uh, performance of certain tasks. If a model is good for task classification, it will probably be able uh, to have, uh, the, after a training of task classification, to improve the classification of language, and it will be able to have to do a translation of text or a summary of text. Although the, the tasks are different, the knowledge acquired in one task can help the carry out another task. And because of that, you create benchmarks, which are standardized ways of, of uh, analyzing development with, this, with, with the same task. You have different tests, uh, for the same task in, in the same model. You evaluate how this model, how good the model is, knowing that in general, the, develop, the performance of one task will help the other ones. Now, we are talking about examples of benchmarks of this type. The most famous benchmark, and it's not even two years old, and the most famous uh, benchmark for understanding text is called GLUE. It's the General Language Understanding Evaluation. It has a, a set of 11 tasks in this number of categories. I will talk about these categories for you to understand the diversity of these task, tasks and how it, what it represents in the cognitive point of view. This one is COLA. The, the, its function is to recognize uh, well-formed, well-grammatically-formed for, uh, sentences. It gets a group of texts that, that are considered well-written like famous uh, 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 authors uh, that wrote many texts. And then uh, some people were hired to um, looking at this grammatically well-written sentence to do the transformation of a sentence that introduces a grammatical mistake. The task is by looking at a sentence uh, to know if they are in the group of correctly, a gra grammatically correct sentence or not. If you explicit the grammar in terms of rules, you can classify correct correctly if it's well formed or badly formed. Of course, there are some ambiguity cases in which the rules are not enough to eliminate. Another one is the sentiment analysis, specifically here is regarding uh, summary of uh, movies. 
um, you have a text uh, that can be uh, criticizing or favoring uh, a certain text. And you have redundant information of this uh, summary of the movie and another s summary of the person who, who graded this, uh, this movie. If it's four or five stars, it's, uh, you understand that the text is favorable to the text. If it's one two stars, it's not favorable. So uh, it can uh, interpret if that text is uh, criticism or is it fav in favor of the movie. So it's a little more difficult because it uh, does a classification of sentiment an an analysis of the movie. It uses uh, machine learning with different number of negative and positive texts. And little by little, the machine develops internal rules of how the relative frequency of different words is associated to a positive feeling. Uh, another, the semantic equivalence in, in sentences. You have the well-written corpus or group of, of texts and you get a sentence and you create another sentence that is similar to the original sentence or the paraphrases and, but it has a different in, the me in the meaning and the task is given two sentences to say if they are equivalent to one another or if they say different things can you see how it becomes more and more complex going to an abstract semantic layer that is hard to be described in terms of rules and finally, a general generalization of the previous one, uh, instead of just saying if it's equivalent or not in terms of semantics, it, it shows the level of similarity in a scale, uh, if it's like 20% similar or 80% similar. This other one here brings the logical inference of premises and hypotheses. The one sentence says something general and another one says something that is more specific so you need to, to infer classify if the second one is a logical um, continuation of the first one but these sentences are not described in a language of formal logic we could do that if the data wasn't like that but they are in natural language finally uh, questions and answers. You can have a set of text that describe something and then there are questions regarding to the text and the algorithm will create a response to that question based on the text. And finally, the disambiguation of pronouns. It seems easy and simple. For example, I have a sentence like the dog was walking and then uh, the, the next sentence is it stopped. So it refers to the dog. There are cases that there is a possible object is ambiguous. So there are several possible objects. In some cases, you can use the gender of the pronoun to separate if it is if the previous sentence is masculine or feminine. But in other situations, the grammar doesn't help you. You need to have the understanding of the thing, of the physical, real phenomena to be able to attribute the origin of that pronoun. For example, if I say that I tried to put the flute inside the box, but it was too little, the, it refers to the box or the flute. You see that you cannot deduce it by only using grammar. You need to have the understanding of the world. For something not to be able to fit in another, that thing you're trying to put in inside that is too big. If I invert the meaning of the sentence, say the flute inside the box, so you understand that the box is too little. So I hope it's, uh, it's clear to you that these tasks are not trivial. If you can do them well, you're approximating the semantic understanding of the language. Now we can see the results. There are many results that are important. And it's important to know that this benchmark was created uh, less than two years ago. So the results, so, uh, the results are super, super recent. And the, th the third one is human development in the last two months. And many models started being created and the, the performance was higher than the ones of human beings. 
Now I'm going to discuss another uh, text interpretation problem. So this is a data set. It was written by uh, human beings, and so they get articles from Wikipedia, and they ask questions about the content on Wikipedia. And so they already know what would be the right answer that corresponds to each one of these questions. And they also create uh, controversial questions that seems to be your question, but encompass knowledge that is not on that Wikipedia page. So the algorithm based on that question is either going to give you the correct answer or to say there are no answers to that question in that text. And then you can see that the human performance was overcome by this combination between BERT and other, other DAE, AOA, and others. And so the performance is growing quickly. So we believe that the superiority of the behavior and the performance of algorithms is going to continue growing. And this is very important. Sometimes we tend to think that our performance is the best, is wonderful. No, it's possible to have a better performance depending on the cognitive items. And then finally, we have a data set called race, which is reading comprehension from English examinations. And so this data set was built by Chinese professors so that they could assess their students when it comes to reading comprehension exercises. So it was created for children between the ages of 12 and 18. And we have many, many excerpts. And there are questions. There are co reading comprehension questions related to these texts. And so this was something that was created to test human beings. So it goes way beyond vocabulary questions, linguistics questions. So it has to do with common sense. And so that is the differential of this these data set. So what would be a good title for this excerpt in the text? What w was the attitude of the author, author of the text related to the industry awards? What are the following, uh, which one of the following statements is wrong according to the text? And so, uh, so there is an exercise uh, uh, similar to this. I'm going to read this very briefly. I apologize to the interpreters if they cannot follow up. So the, te the taxi driver didn't have a single ride all day long. When he was driving by the railway station, he said, where are you going? I'm going to the Red Hotel. When the taxi driver heard that, he didn't feel happy because the young man was only going to give him $3. But then he had an idea. So he traveled around many, many streets in the big city. And we arrived at the hotel. You have to pay me $15. Please, the taxi driver told the young man, what, $15, do you think I'm silly? I got a taxi uh, at the railway station and I only paid $12. I know how much I have to pay for the trip. So you understand the trick of the taxi drivers uh, regarding this young person. And this uh, text is complex to understand what's behind it and the questions. Probably the taxi driver finally received how many dollars? Which of the following statements is true? Both taxi drivers were honest. Both taxi drivers uh, tricked the young passenger. It's far away uh, between the train station and uh, the Red Hotel. And the young man knew the distance between the train station and the Red Hotel. And already, this exercise already shows you how difficult the cognitive analysis was. And the performance, once again, was higher than the human performance. So this is the performance of the best model that was published in June of 2018. And it was significantly better than the human behavior done by mechanical turkers. They are workers that give answers to 
uh, uh, to answers to the mechanical turtles uh, online. They are paid to do this with uh, simpler texts. And so we have English tests for 13-year-olds, and so the the model was just a little a little higher. And so now, as uh, students of high school, it was better. And so the the I don't know what he's saying. I think he's saying Turkers, Turkers. And so the uh, then you have the questions and the answers, and this is the highest performance, and it's based on incoherences in the text. So the maximum would be 94%, would be 85 and 99, and the performance of the best algorithm is already 85.80%. .80%. And so uh, now reading comprehension can already be, be computerized. So this is a new data set. I believe it's only two months old. And it's a science test. It's not the Chinese using English. Now we have students, high school students, trying to understand the sciences. And then we have more complex uh, thinking. And so the text starts. Which changes would probably cause a reduction in the number of squirrels that live in a certain area? Option number one to reduce the number of predators, number two, to reduce the competition between the squirrels, number three, to increase the uh, food available, to increase the number of forest fires. And so to answer this with high performance and high levels of, uh, of being correct, this is, this is only an ecology question. But then they have physical phenomenon, a pendulum, a chemical reactions, and so the fields of knowledge vary a lot. And so these are the results. This test started in 2016. It was uh, promoted by DARPA, and it had 60% of correct answers for uh, high school children who are 13 years of age. And in 2019, it was 90% correct and the 13-year-olds got 83%. So whenever the algorithms are better than the humans, it doesn't mean that they are understanding the text. It means that the assessment test is simple enough that allows the algorithm to be optimized. It doesn't mean that it's going to understand the text uh, in general like you, but it's able to trick us and to pretend that is understanding uh, uh, just as we are based on the metrics that we have. But we cannot believe that they have deep knowledge. And so, uh, so the high performance in these tests does not prove deep or real uh, understanding. And controversial examples focusing on co uh, comprehension of basic concepts frequently have lower performance. So my time is uh, over, so I'm going to conclude. And so this is very interesting. I'm going to publish my slides, and you can see what kind of text was generated. And so these texts, you cannot tell that these texts were written by a machine. It's difficult to tell. And so finally, the conclusion. NLP problems have not been solved yet. It's still an open frontier. And so uh, the, the processing uh, speed is really, really high. And this is a good moment to enter now. And so we're now bearing fruit almost every week. And there is a specific uh, challenge for the NLP in Portuguese. We have only a few data sets in Portuguese that have been well defined, that the tasks have been well created. And so we're still uh, creating models in Portuguese, and we are adapting everything into Portuguese. We have already had good models, but not good enough to see the qualitative jump or leap, sorry, pardon me, leap that we had in English. And when, in, in ter, uh, when it comes to capacity building, we are offering NLP courses here at the Court of Accounts here. We have already organized many classes, and we have some pictures. This is a class uh, on a Saturday morning in the building near here, and 100% uh, of the people here are civil servants. And this is uh, how it is disseminated around the world. And then we have Brasilia, 
and so now it's visible in Latin America. So people studying NLP and deep learning using this. And finally, this is our study group reference, and you can learn these things with us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Eric. Now I would like to invite everybody to uh, to the stage so that we can have the Q&A session. So I'm going to start. The first question is for Eric. We believe that this panorama is amazing. And so we are planting seeds in the people who are watching the seminar, attending the seminar, in terms of the tropicalization of these tools. So where should we start? The person saw this, they found it awesome. Oh, yes, I need this. This would solve my problem, a specific problem in my agency. But it's in English. So where should I start to uh, tropicalize this? What are the chances of working out? What are the chances of not working out? So our experience with L and fit, L and feet, and so it's the biggest fo problem. First was the well, and the other one was LM Fit. And it was created by the author of the course that we call Fast AI. And so when we ta talk about LM Fit, they're going to give us a recipe on how to tropicalize everything. And you're going to do the scrapping of the Wikipedia. You can download the Wikipedia in Portuguese. And this is going to give you the corpus. And it, there, it's going to learn Portuguese. And so once you have trained the new model using the Wikipedia in Portuguese, it's hard work. It's going to require uh, hard work. But it's going to require 10 hours of training. And so once this model has already been trained into Portuguese, you can make it become specialized in a specific task using your personal data. And they can be reinserted uh, as a non-supervised to that format of language. So uh, TCU rulings. And then it's going to start reading the, the TCU uh, rulings. And it's going to get used to the language used at the court of accounts, the TCU. And then you place a classifier on top of this. Tell me, what is the topic of this ruling? And then after you train it with a limited number of examples, it's going to say, ah, this is about a personnel problem. This is a surveillance that uh, led us to a, a criminal civil servant. And so the biggest difficulty is the availability of good data sets. I have a question on Twitter for you, and Taina Oliveira asked this question. Has anybody used NLP within the electronic uh, repository of information? Because you have all the bureaucracy of several different public agencies, and a lot of intelligence can be extracted, but everything is buried, and you need this expertise so that you can do the data mining and require uh, and uh, obtain good information. Have you seen it? No, I haven't seen any application. And so we need to have a boom of data sets. We need a lot of text. We need tens of thousands of texts with a certain minimum size, a minimum size. Four or five sentences with a minimum number of uh, words and associated metadata. So the translation of this text to another language. And so maybe uh, uh, many made data many metadata could be inferred, and then you would be able to create a model like this. 
So I have many, many questions. The first question is, have you been talking to the federal government about this? Have you been exchanging experience? Are you still testing everything locally and validating things? Well, the project is recent. It started in October of last year. And now we are waiting for the second phase to be launched uh, to use the reference table. And then we're going to carry out the, the simulations of electronic public biddings. And we're going to have a minimum amount of numbers to come here and even talk to you. But no, no contact has been made with the federal government, only in the state uh, court uh, courts of accounts. Are you going to have an API of this? so that other levels of the government, the state governments, the, the federal government can consume this? Well, the API is not public yet, but it's already working. And I heard yesterday from the project, ma because the project manager is, uh, is always the last person to know. And so there are some people in the Northeast region, and they signed uh, an agreement that the platform, the price of the market w was going to be used by other states in the Northeast. And so I imagine, are you going to do that? And so they have already concluded everything. And so there is an entire team of people. And I believe they're going to use this. Are you going to use it? And so we don't know if we're going to concentrate the database inside the, the Paraíba Court of Accounts. A Paraíba is a state in the Northeast. And so we have data from Acefaz, from Pernambuco, and from Espírito Santo to do something similar. I don't know if they want to uh, uh, make everything be clustered there, and the database would be there, the platform would be there, or if they want to share the platform with us. I don't know what's going to be the decision, but I believe I believe that it's going to be concentrated there. But the API is ready. It's working as a, the, for the first two and for the second two. And we need to replicate this process and universalize this process. At the federal government, we don't have access to the electronic invoices for the federal uh, procurement processes. Even though they are public information, we do not have access to this. They are on the, the government uh, bulletin, uh, information bulletin, but information newsletter, but we don't have this. But besides this, this very important part of the puzzle. Do you think it's feasible for you to create scrapping robots to scrap uh, websites of supermarkets to study the prices of the products or is not going to be good? Well, what we are doing is exactly the opposite. So companies that sell retail information, they are trying to scrap everything from our website to sell because that's where we have the real price. So the information on our website, they are underestimated because we don't have logistics support and so everything becomes cheaper than the, the real retail prices. And so regarding the, regarding the federal government not having access to the information, and so a few years ago there was an agreement among all of the states and the federal government to normalize the layout of the electronic invoices. And the agreement was each state is going to have their own database, but they're going to be a centralized backup up database managed by the IRS. This information already exists, but the access is something different. It's a whole different story. The first question that I thought people were, were going to ask were about the secrecy uh, breaking to public uh, prices of a company without the prior authority of this company. Is it um, the breaking of secrecy or not? Well, it could be an issue years ago, but it's, it's a little bit out in, a, in a, a outdated, um, an outdated concept. Imagine to get all the public information of prices of all supermarkets. So anyone can go to the supermarket and look at the prices. I'm just putting all these uh, sh uh, shop, shop windows in the, on the internet. So if I note the amount of items uh, sold by the company, yes, in this case, it would be a problem of secrecy invasion because I would estimate the, the income of that company. 
but just showing the price is not uh, that uh, problem like that. And we, we don't also uh, publicize uh, information of uh, purchase routine about the consumption. So not by far it, it will attack the secrecy or them uh, bring problems to to the the companies but the strength that the 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 country the government will have to access this data and all the uh, the agencies called CFIs to do it even uh, having an app for the population to be able to buy things cheaper uh, we have it in six to seven states and it, when it, it becomes national this stigma of uh, secrecy uh, invasion will will fall at, uh, definitely. I have some questions to Monica. Uh, one of them is from Julia Pubel. Monica from Anvisa. Uh, how do you evaluate the application of the the other medications and the health um, products? That would be the next step. We were had a barrier, uh, which was database itself. For bio biological medications, we, we have a, an adjusted database. And it, even with that, it took eight months to do the cleaning of, of this database. So uh, we spent a long time doing this, and we need to organize it all. In the generic medication, new medication, and similar medication, we are organizing, we are in the, in the phase of organizing of the database, uh, standardization, the cleaning, but the idea is to extend this methodology to other types of medication. Great. The other question is, w was it able to, for an visa to validate the register of uh, medication automatically if other agencies of other countries have uh, authorized uh, the medication or to, to find criteria? for the, the medication that were rejected. So it, it makes sense. It is this discussion, well, I'm going to give my opinion, it's not the opinion of the agency. It's a very uh, large uh, discussion. We have a, mo a global movement in terms of organizing data. And what happens is Brazil has um, climate change, clim uh, climate zones that are different from other countries. Um, so we have regional specificities, and it, it is not only a characteristic of Brazil. Other countries that are not part of the U.S. and Europe, they also need, they also request these regional adaptations. But the big uh, tendency is for us to organize the data according to a global understanding. But there will always be regional differences. It is a well-accepted practice all around the world uh, in all discussions of different entities uh, of countries that are not part of Europe and, and the United States. They always uh, include this issue of the regional uh, specificities uh, of each country. For example, uh, uh, recently I participated in a, in a medical identification discussion and we're trying to organize the entry of data in our systems uh, for everyone in the US and the Europe use the same vocabulary so that we can exchange uh, information globally with this we will have an adjustment on this type of, of trend even with this there is an acknowledgement of the countries that are doing these adjustments to some regional adaptations. Is this uh, acknowledgement in the basis of cost benefit? Because you analyze all the medications again, medication that come from other countries, they are, are analyzed again in our country. So because maybe only 5% of them ha need really need a uh, regional adaptation. Well, I don't know about the cost benefit cost-benefit analysis. The analysis that we do when we elaborate a norm, and it, it is interesting when you mention that because when we work uh, guided by the international guidelines, we don't have this data analysis. The data will allow us, uh, when we start centralizing the analysis in data, it will allow us to answer these questions. We're going, we're going to have space to debate 
uh, the cost benefit to follow a legislation uh, completely. The risk analysis is done today uh, compared to the international standards. What about the data in Brazil? How can they be used to add information, specific information to Brazil? When we start using this data, uh, the cost benefit analysis will be able to we will be able to use the cost uh, ana uh, analysis more frequently. One more question to you here, uh, Monica. Uh, how do the users report uh, the side effects to a visa? How often do do they often do, do the citizens uh, report that, and what is the response for that? I asked this question of how many people took medication in the last month and almost everyone raised their hands and when I asked them if they had ever notified an inside effect no one raised their hands so the reply is not um, individual for the person what we do is the information of a side effect notification provides a warning for the medication in the post-market uh, mom moment. When, the, when you have this notification and this warning is made and it has a degree that is higher than expected, we have reactions of health surveillance in this medication. And I want to add that it is important for the, the population to notify it uh, because it will um, aggregate or it will add uh, a signal for the risk of that medication on the market. It's, it's, it, it can create an important uh, warning. And the regulating um, agencies around, around the world are making an effort for the, for the participation of the population in this practice. Marcelo, could you talk about the business, the problem that you're trying to solve? I understood the technique, that you, the, the tool set that you're using to find similar texts. But for us, we are outside of the world of CVM. What, what is it good for exactly? Um, do you have the um, hard disk of 12 uh, companies and you, you want to check the documents that one company exchanged with the other? So at the end of the process, what is, it, what is the use of it? What, is, what problem is it solving? You gave a great example. It is not only one way but it's a group of documents that we gather through the investigation in order to have uh, evidences or proof that people committed the crimes in the market either in the cooperative world, societies or illegal recuperation in the stock market it, it all can be used so it is one more problem that we have there in, the, in our superintendents that we can deal with all the areas, all the technical areas of CVN, um, funds, market, market, external auditing, uh, independent auditing. S the the type of documents that we can find and be able to analyze to prove or not by filing or to propose uh, the filing of a person. It can also have uh, sentence repercussions. We can um, look, uh, look at the prosecution office. So to find information that we can transform in, into proof for a sentence. In, the, in, in our case, the administrative case. Now the hardest question I'm going to ask Eric. Eric, it's a question by Julia Pubel on Twitter. So many uh, performances will overcome the human uh, performance. What uh, human uh, abilities are threat in, under threat and what are safeguards? It's a uh, difficult question. There's no good answer for that. It's speculative. But what we, when we consider that there's a certain type of test that requires requires a typically cognitive capacity that is human, a sensibility. Uh, we think that 
it's just a matter of time that you can find another model, another way to use the available data to make projections and calculations that will over overcome the develop that develop the performance that is considered to be high. So there's there are attempts to say that we are strong in some things that the machines are not as good. For example, common sense, which is something really hard to be explicit. But many elements of common sense, and we can see that in the recent models, can be extracted in the form of automatic text. But we needed to check all texts written by mankind. In that case, you would have some examples of the application of common sense. So you can gener generalize the application of good sense by using these examples. Let me just update to check if there are more questions. A question to Marcel from CVN. The results with doc 2 vec seem that they have not been really good. Do you have an explanation for that? Did you try to change the training algorithm of doc 2 vet and compare PDVN and Bag of Words? It's a good question. In the beginning, we uh, were connected to the package and the reference that we had, and we used the standard settings that were already there. In the case of the two divisions, in doc 2 vec and work 2 vec have both different, the distributed memory had been described since the first paper uh, regarding doc 2 vec it has the reference in the presentation, it, it will be available to you. And the distributed memory performed better, so we kept it. But we didn't have, we didn't uh, try this trick. And TM is like one, and it's done by default in distributed memory. So we didn't switch it. What we plan to do is beside changing this one is to uh, change some parameters. This question was important because I want to talk about some parameters such as the window that I didn't mention in my presentation. I came here, I was on vacation, I came here straight uh, straight to the presentation. I was writing the presentation, reviewing it, and I found a video of one of the developers of the G5. Uh, it's a video of made in Berlin 2007 and he mentions the parameter and I thought it was interesting when you have it small it provides a similarity that is the this thing of the exchange or the synonym like clothes for example I will relate clothes to clothing in other words if the these words are in the vocabulary but when you enlarge this window cons to consider 10 words one next to the other it has meanings and semantics and similarities of other types of relations for example clothes and wardrobe so they are not synonyms but they have a similarity that can be captured so that's what we intend to do later to add this type of parameter so this is it, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for the participants. Thank you for the ones who stayed until the end of this, this day. So we're going to wrap up the seminar. We thank you very much for your presence. And remember the workshops that will happen tomorrow. Eric already explained the rules. And we wait for you here tomorrow. Thank you so much.